Welcome back now, everyone, for part two of the Age of American Revolution. We saw in part one of the lecture that contrary to what we often like to remember about the American Revolution, tell each other about it, especially when we're teaching uh, our children, that uh, contrary to that typical message, the American colonists living in the English colonies of North America were not simply chomping at the bit to become independent, uh, separate, sovereign Americans. Uh, by and large, life within the British Empire had been benign and profitable and liberty-inducing. But because of a uh, an imperial crisis, that is, because of crisis within the British Empire to which the 13 colonies were subject, uh, ultimately, the tensions and strains uh, and conflict that that crisis uh, brought about uh, forced the hand of, uh, of colonists to determine whether or not their future path might not be better set on a course of independence. But this was only a belated recognition coming not at the outset of the imperial crisis, uh, but uh, rather... Uh, several years in, and even after conflicts like the Stamp Act crisis prompted a closer look at traditional questions of liberty, uh, even then the majority of con colonists held off from approaching such a radical solution uh, as independence. In fact, the first statements of formal protest during the imperial crisis with England uh, those issued during the so-called Stamp Act uh, crisis that we talked about at the end of the last lecture, uh, those first statements of formal protest uh, were on behalf of individual uh, rights. Uh, that is, according to the Stamp Act Congress, a political body uh, gathered from among the many colonies uh, to address the issue of the stamp tax, uh, that from the Stamp Act Congress came forward a statement that said, among other things, that His Majesty's liege subjects in these colonies, note they're referring to themselves as His Majesty's liege subjects, hardly a call for or, uh, independence, that His Majesty's liege subjects, as loyal subjects in these colonies, are entitled to all the inherent rights and privileges of his natural-born subjects within the Kingdom of Great Britain. In other words, they want their rights as Englishmen, not as independent Americans, but as Englishmen under the British constitutional system. That is inseparably essential to the freedom of a people, they continued, and the undoubted rights of Englishmen, there's that phrase again, rights of Englishmen, not Americans, not separate, sovereign, independent states, but the rights of Englishmen, that no taxes should be imposed on them, but with their own consent, given personally or by their representatives. Well, now, that was quite an interesting point, this business over who had the authority to tax, uh, as we'll see, will become one of the central dividing principles between the colonists uh, and the mother country. But at least insofar as this statement was concerned in 1765, the colonists saw themselves not as moving toward independence, but moving closer to the center of what they believed being English subjects was all about. That is, a conservative statement by self-professed English subjects. Yet as colonists, their ideal of no taxation without representation was based not on English traditions in England, but rather on local traditions of freeholder voting and local taxation throughout the colonies. As of yet, this apparent contradiction uh, seemed not to uh, seem not to promise a revolutionary road, but rather merely a correcting of the uh, you know the correct perspective. That is a correcting of perspective. And what about the question of taxation and representation? You consider that those in the mother country, that is Englishmen living in England shouldered an imperial tax burden that was nearly 26 times greater 
than that of most Amer North American colonists. It's often cavalierly suggested that somehow the tax burden on the colonists was unjust and tyrannical and therefore revolution and independence was necessary. Uh, but that doesn't hold up, not by any objective account, when you consider that the tax burden shouldered by the colonists was 1 26th as heavy as that shouldered by many Englishmen in the mother country. And, and this is a point that many British officials quickly picked up. Some Jennings, a member of Parliament in the year of the Stamp Act, said with regard to political representation, quote, no man that I know of is taxed by his own consent. For every Englishman is taxed and not one in 20 represented. Copyholders, leaseholders, and all men possessed of personal property only choose no representatives. Manchester, Birmingham, and many more of our most flourishing trading towns send no members to Parliament. Consequently, cannot consent by their representatives because they choose none to represent them. Yet are they not Englishmen, or are they not taxed? If Parliament is possessed of this right, why should it be exercised with more delicacy in America than it has ever been, and even in Great Britain itself? And so Jennings' point, clearly stated, was that the colonists were claiming a right as Englishmen that Englishmen in England didn't have, that is, of direct representation for taxation purposes. Of course, the difference was that in the colonies, thanks to traditions of local government, in the absence of stricter imperial government, sometimes called benign or salutary neglect by England, in the absence of stricter imperial government and regulation, the colonists simply took to taxing themselves over time. That is voting for representatives in their colonial assemblies who could, among other things, pass taxation members. It was never a right specifically spelled out by England, but rather a kind of default pattern that the colonies had fallen into. And now that the colonists during this imperial crisis were asserting it as an indelible right, folks in England, including parliamentarians like Jennings, were confused and puzzled by it, since it had never been expressed as a right either in England nor formally expressed as a right by England for the colonists. Maybe just as important as this constitutional wrangle over taxation was the fact that this new regulation by Britain, coming in the midst of an imperial crisis, a, a global crisis for the British Empire, was also coming, therefore, at a bad time economically for the colonists. Perhaps in better days it wouldn't have raised as many concerns. But a post-war crash, that is an economic crash, following the Seven Years' War, had left many colonists hard-pressed to pay their debts. As the New Yorker newspaper put it in 1764, everything is tumbling down, even the merchants themselves. So at a time of economic breakdown in the colonies, growing indebtedness, uh, poverty, etc., it seemed that the colonists were in no mood to take on a new burden of taxation, no matter how, how slight, and were looking for reasons to deflect it. Many commoners chose, of course, to resist policy for purely their own reasons. And if we were to look at different colonies, we would find different protests regarding the Stamp Act. Uh, as the new imperial policies restricted local port economies, especially shipping, uh, we would expect to see and do see protest in the port towns, such as Boston, who seem to be most directly affected by the new imperial regulations. But others felt similarly. A Philadelphia artisan, James Cannon, who lived in a port city and plied his trade as an artisan in the port city, said it is, quote, the happiness of America that there is no rank above that of freemen existing in it. And much of our future welfare and tranquility will depend on its remaining so forever. Honesty, common sense, and a plain understanding are fully equal to the task. Think about what Cannon is saying here for a second. It's not so much that he's debating constitutional law with the English as he is asserting that the conditions, social and economic uh, 
among common working folk in the colonies entitles them to the same basic considerations as those men of property, those wealthy or landed, let's say, who were traditionally given deference in political authorities. According to Cannon, at least, his views as a common working man were just as important and were to be treated equally with those of any other. This, again, represents a departure from English understanding, where typically it was true uh, the propertied, the elites, uh, the noble, uh, the well-educated were given political deference. But the pattern had been different in the American colonies, and so we see Cannon raising the point. In fact, it would be among the common ranks that much of the support for a kind of resistance movement, not an independence movement yet, we're too soon for that, but a resistance movement to what they saw as in imperial interference in their local affairs. Among the resistance inspired, of course, was a boycott of British goods which becomes central to the protest strategies uh, of these years of the 1760s and early 1770s and one that involved uh, regular folk, uh, the common ranks of society including colonial women as participants in Atlantic world politics. A good example of that would be the so-called homespun movement. The colonial homespun movement was a political tool to encourage support of the patriot cause, one in which women played a central part. The idea here was that instead of purchasing imported English textiles, the colonial woman would take to the spinning wheel and sewing bees and create for their families homespun cloth uh, to be worn as tunics and dresses uh, and trousers and caps, uh, that is to make a clothing that would designate one not only uh, self-reliant and independent in one's needs, but also a member of this resistance movement. In other words, it was a way to identify yourself as a patriot that you wore homespun uh, clothing. This sort of thing suggested that there was more than just a disagreement over policy, but something like a definite split was growing in the Atlantic world, a split between the colonial interests, particularly those of common working uh, folk uh, in the colonies whose livelihoods depended on the continued trade of the port towns and the importation of cheap goods, uh, and the uh, the larger imperial interests of, of Great Britain. That is, the split between the two was beginning to seem like something more than a conservative disagreement over taxation. Colonial newspapers eagerly reprinted the speeches of one John Wilkes, uh, a member of Parliament in England who happened to be a fierce critic of England's royal finance ministers, uh, men who he, call, he called tools of corruption and despotism. Uh, Wilkes supported the colonial cause and then thus won uh, a following in the colonies uh, of those who, who read and reported his speeches and who now saw the possibility that uh, even certain members of the English governing system might uh, see their cause as supportable. There was also a darker fear, almost conspiratorial fear brewing in some quarters of the colonies that all of this, that is all of this new regulation was part of an English government plot to reduce the colonists to slavery. That is to a subject status a little better than slavery where they would simply be required to do the heavy lifting for the British Empire and to pay most of its upkeep. The rift had opened in the Atlantic world at the very moment that the English Empire's military power reached its greatest height, after all, that is victory in the Seven Years' War. The colonists believed their independence was being traded for slavery. Listen to John Dickinson of Pennsylvania. We cannot be happy without being free, wrote Dickinson. We cannot be free without being secure in our property. We cannot be secure in our property, he wrote, if without our consent others may, as by right, 
take it away. That taxes imposed on us by Parliament do thus take it away. Dickinson's uh, point here has now ratcheted up uh, the level of debate in a sense because no longer is he saying that the main grievance is that somehow the colonists aren't represented in Parliament, but that Parliament has any right whatsoever to tax in the first place. Uh, that is, that the security of the property of colonists is rendered lost if Parliament, 3,000 miles across the ocean, can levy taxes which draw from that property holding. So again, the evolution of the disagreement, you might say, by the late 1760s has some colonists like Dickinson questioning whether Parliament under any circumstances could legitimately impose a tax on British subjects living in the colonies. For the colonists at least, property and independence were inseparable. And they believed now that too many in England had neither property or independence. Benjamin Franklin himself wrote, Let them with three-fourths of the people of Ireland live the year round on potatoes and buttermilk without shirts. Let them with the generality of the common people of Scotland go barefoot. And if they will be content to wear rags like the spinners and weavers of England. This was a reminder that there existed in England uh, itself uh, that is within the United Kingdom of England, Ireland, and Scotland, uh, a more or less permanent, seemingly permanent, impoverished class of poor folk. Poor folk whose lives live below a material standard of the poorest in America, at least of free men in America. And Franklin's uh, point seems to be that the reason for that is because those poor, those poor Irish and Scots and even English uh, day laborers and, and those without uh, property and such, a kind of beggar class, really, of people, that it was somehow due to the fact that they didn't have political representation. So so now the colonists are, are acknowledging that the kind of political representation they're insisting on from England is not a political representation that even folks in England have, uh, but that uh, rather than that being a reason not to demand it, it was all the more reason to protect it since those who in England didn't have that kind of political voice suffered in the squalid ranks of poverty. And that was not something that uh, colonists like Franklin were willing to see foisted on Americans. And so some were beginning to believe that the mother country and her colonies no longer shared the same mutual interests or common goals. What had started out over really a quibble over the finer points of, say, uh, imperial administration and taxation policy had really ballooned now by the early 1770s, uh, a full decade after the Seven Years' War had ended, uh, by the early 1770s into something like uh, potentially a revolutionary crisis. Uh, that is, the estrangement between the colonists and their perception of law and politics and government and that of the mother country uh, was growing ever wider. And yet, and yet, until Thomas Paine, basically, uh, in 1776, uh, the word revolution or even the word independence is rarely mentioned. Uh, Payne, an Englishman who migrates to the colonies and begins writing in 1776, uh, says in his famous pamphlet, Common Sense, we have been long led away by ancient prejudices and made large sacrifices to superstition. We have boasted the protection of Great Britain without considering that her motive was interest, not attachment, that she did not protect us from our enemies of our account, but from her enemies on her account. So Paine's argument in Common Sense, which proves to be a pamphlet that is widely popular, uh, I think it's fair to say perhaps the first best-selling piece of literature in American history, uh, selling half a million uh, copies in an age when uh, you know it was uh, 
uh, almost impossible to receive daily news uh, outside the cities uh, that this pamphlet printed and circulated and passed from tavern to tavern from farm to farm hand to hand the Payne's common sense pamphlet uh, which boldly put forward the idea uh, that there was no cementing uh, tie between the colonists any longer and England. That is, in effect, what Paine was saying, that the colonists had become seemingly a separate people, not simply English subjects, but something like Americans. And this was a startling, startling claim and a startling assertion, but one that will find traction now in the heightened tension of the imperial crisis. Just as many colonists refused to consider the criminal option of separation, however, and who remained loyal to England in the Atlantic dispute, we don't want to forget that this is nothing like a majority yet, even those who are willing to follow pain down a more radical road. Listen to Jonathan Boucher, a Maryland church minister. If the form of government under which the good providence of God hath been pleased to place us be mild and free, it is our duty to enjoy it with gratitude and with thankfulness, and in particular to be careful not to abuse it by licentiousness. If it be less indulgent and less liberal than in reason it ought to be, still it is our duty not to disturb and destroy the peace of the community by becoming refractory and rebellious subjects and resisting the ordinance of God. So Boucher saying here that by and large, the colonists have profited, will continue to profit from the protection afforded by the British Empire and its rather liberal government. Keep in mind that the government of England at the time was, by almost any measure, the most liberty-granting, freedom-protecting government uh, in the world. And if it wasn't perfect, says Boucher, nevertheless, uh, it was preferable to chaos uh, and to the uncertainties of a revolutionary uh, path. In fact, such a path, according to Boucher, was equatable with licentiousness. That is the taking of license, basically the ignoring of all order, all authority to act uh, really chaotically if one's mood so uh, uh, required it. Uh, this was not something that a conservative like Boucher was willing to tolerate, and so he uh, steadfastly encouraged his parishioners to uh, reject the resistance movement. And yet it seemed that, as the Declaration of Independence would later say, that the course of events were overtaking uh, even the colonists. Uh, the famous uh, woodcut uh, uh, you know, graphic illustration here uh, by the Boston uh, publisher uh, Paul Revere uh, convinced many colonists that they had no choice but to resist by any means England's policy. The famous Boston Massacre, uh, a 1770 engraving uh, by Paul Revere, as I say, uh, produced less than a month after the event uh, in which five colonists died. According to your textbook author Eric Foner, although quite inaccurate in depicting what was actually a disorganized brawl between residents of Boston and British soldiers, this image became one of the most influential pieces of political propaganda in the revolutionary era, helping to stir up resentment against Great Britain. So don't miss the point here. This is propaganda. This is an appeal to emotion. This is not an accurate depiction of what happened in Boston in 1770 when a column of British soldiers fired on a mob of Boston citizens who had jeered them and pelted them with snowballs and taunted them uh, until finally uh, the, uh, the first shot was fired, uh, creating the first casualties, you will, if you will, of the American Revolution. Never mind the facts of the case. A case that, by the way, Patriot John Adams took up as a defense lawyer defending the British Redcoats and winning, basically, their acquittal. Uh, never mind the facts of the case. The propaganda spoke louder and it appealed directly to the emotions. And just the, the image itself, which seemed to show helpless civilians being gunned down by uh, foreign troops, uh, helped uh, undoubtedly to tip the balance now in favor of a more radical 
footpath. Street level demonstrations throughout the port cities in particular joined with the more conservative constitutional arguments as a shared protest language of rights separated a majority of colonists from the loyalists. As John Adams, uh, who I just mentioned, lawyer from Boston and now patriot leader put it, you have rights antecedent to all earthly government, rights that cannot be repealed or restrained by human law, rights derived from the great legislature of the universe. And the key here in Adams's appeal is that there were rights that went beyond governmental rights, that the colonists had rights, natural rights, that existed prior to even parliamentary law and constitutional law in England, and that whenever a government presumed to interfere with those natural rights, then it was the duty of those governed to do something about it. Now, ultimately, these constitutional arguments, street-level protests, and evolving self-perception, I think, of the colonists, only prepared, I think, for what would be ultimately the more radical experience now of military conflict. Uh, as the shot heard round the world, uh, fired in 1775, in the spring of 75, April of 75, began a six-year-long war among members of an Atlantic empire. Keep in mind that the British marching on Lexington and Concord occurs over a year before the Declaration of Independence. And by itself, even that moment was not enough to spur the colonists to claim independence. The Salem Gazette reported from Salem, Massachusetts in April of 75 that last Wednesday, the 19th of April, his troops, excuse me, the troops of his Britannic Majesty commenced hostilities upon the people of this province. Attended with circumstances of cruelty, not less brutal than what our venerable ancestors received from the vilest savages of the wilderness. So an inflammatory piece by the local paper, uh, having the attack by the British equated now with the most brutal attack of our venerable ancestors against the vilest savages. So they're a bit of uh, poetic license, you might say, referring to the Indian Wars of the previous century, equating the British imperial army now with the vilest savages of the colonial imagination. It took over a year uh, for the full effect of this military uh, advance by the Redcoats, that is by the British Army. It took over a year from the point of Lexington and Concord until June of 76 that the Continental Congress, a special political body called together to represent the colonial viewpoint now in the deepening crisis with Britain, that the Continental Congress representing each of the 13 colonies uh, which meets uh, convenes in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, will appoint a five-man committee to draft a Declaration of Independence, including Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, and Benjamin Franklin, who we have already, uh, already mentioned. Now, the purpose of the Declaration, as Thomas Jefferson later recalled, was to, quote, place before mankind the common sense of the subject in terms so plain and firm as to command their assent and to justify ourselves in the independent stand we are compelled to take. Most of the document was taken up with listing the specific grievances which the colonies had against George III. And note how important that was, that the Declaration of Independence was addressed to the English king. No longer could the colonists find comfort in the uh, assumption that they were English subjects who were looked after by their English king. Now their very complaint was directed at the monarch himself. Most of the document, though listing grievances against King George III, uh, actually followed what is the more famous part of the Declaration, the so-called preamble. And as Thomas Jefferson's biographer points out, it is the two beginning paragraphs of the Declaration that it's, are its most famous, most influential, and best remembered. When in the course of 
of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. And here in Jefferson's words is the famous central core of the preamble. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and institute a new government. Now in writing these words, Jefferson drew upon what he called the harmonizing sentiments of the day to give his words a focus, including many works, ancient and modern, though he did mention John Locke, English political philosopher by name, Jefferson's contemporaries as well as generations since have recognized John Locke's influence in Thomas Jefferson's defense of popular sovereignty as a true basis for government. The passage that begins, governments are instituted among men, closely followed Locke's assertion in two treatises of civil government, as did a listing of life and liberty, for example, as two of the three unalienable or natural rights of men. So Jefferson's ideas here were not necessarily unique uh, to him uh, or even to the colonists of 1776, but instead drew deeply on the political sentiments, constitutional and legal philosophies that had circulated in the Atlantic world over the previous few generations. Being able to bring them together now into a single statement on behalf of the new purpose of independence is what made it all so revolutionary. Men of Jefferson and Franklin's generation had come to believe that certain fundamental principles of political philosophy were self-evident, as he put it. Just as Isaac Newton had shown that the law of gravity and motion represented the bedrock of physical law, Jefferson in the Declaration proclaiming that all men are created equal represents now the bedrock of all political and constitutional law. All right, that's it for now. Uh, the Age of the American Revolution. Of course, you're reading along in the textbook to fill in a lot of the, uh, the narrative details here, but we'll leave it at the moment for now of the Declaration of Independence and then pick up next time with the events of history that ensue.